Okay, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming back. Sorry we didn't have too, too much time for lunch, but hopefully you had a good one. Uh, it sounds like some ice cream was had, so that's excellent. Um, our next two sessions both have to do with DNA. And so our first session is going to be a similar session to the, what Matt taught where it was sort of an overview of DNA and a review of, of what, they, uh, what nucleic acids do. And then we'll have another session similar to what was taught yesterday where we talk a little bit about how to think about DNA and use DNA in your, in your research. And so both of those sessions will be taught by my colleague here, Dr. Chris Johnson, uh, who's our, one of our newest faculty. Actually, we hired three last year. So, uh, but uh, our newest biochemistry faculty, that's for certain. So. Uh, without further ado, take it away, Chris. Hey, good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm always excited to talk to new aspiring scientists uh, and share some information. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, as Nick mentioned, we're going to talk about nucleic acids. Uh, and this is going to harken back to my PhD training. I'm a structural biologist by training. I've been in the hospital world for about 15 years. Uh, these days I study ion channels in the heart and what makes your heart beat, uh, what happens when it goes wrong, and what leads to disease. Uh, but really, this is what I was developed most of my roots in, uh, was structural biology of nucleic acids. So if you look up here on the left, we have a schematic of a person, small little diagram. And if we zoom in, as my four-year-old four -year son always asks, what makes that up? We have a bunch of cells, right? So who can tell me what's inside a cell? What does this represent? By the way, I like discussions, so you guys got to talk. Someone shout it out. What is this thing right here? Come on. Chromosome, right? Eighth grade biology, right? So what's a chromosome? Right? We'll play the four-year-old question game. So here we have a schematic of a chromosome. What's this thing down here on the end of it? A telomere. What is a telomere for? Why do you have them? What do they do? Does anyone know what they regulate? Protein. Yes? Yes? Has anyone heard about the length of your telomeres and what they're important for? Right. Has to do somewhat with aging, right? Has to do with health, has to do with all sorts of things. As you guys start having kids, these are going to become really important, right? You'll go to the doctor and learn a lot about chromosome testing. If you unwind the chromosome, you extend out the telomere, we get down to these things down here, histones. Right? And what makes up a histone? Say again? Well, we have some nucleic acids wrapped around there. Right? So as we keep going down, we keep zooming in, we have nucleic acids, and specifically which nucleic acid makes up your histone wrapped around it here? DNA. DNA, right? So DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid. And if we zoom into the DNA, you can see that it's actually made up these intricate little base pairs. Now, most people in the medical world assume DNA is just a string, like a shoelace. But in fact, DNA is amazing. There's a tremendous amount of structural features to DNA. And what you'll notice is DNA, that you classic double helix here, compacts up into these very highly organized systems. Why would your body want to do that? Why do we care? How many base pairs make up your genome? Any idea? How many do you have? Somewhere around 8 billion, right? That's a lot of information, and you got to put it in an itty bitty tiny space. Okay. So one of my postdocs that I did over in Nashville, uh, an advisor I worked for, he studied how these things replicate, which involves actually unwinding, unpacking all this information. So understanding structural features of this can be important for just about any aspect of life you can think of. What happens if you can't crop, copy over DNA correctly? We'll talk about that later, actually. Right? So question for you guys, how do you study DNA? What could you do? Has anyone seen one of these before? See some heads nodding. So what is this? Someone, someone shout it out. Tell me what this instrument's called. NMR, right? Nuclear magnetic 
resonance spectroscopy. Right? Now, in the hospital, we don't like to call them NMRs. Right? We don't like to say nuclear. Based on the same technology as an MRI, with just a few tweaks. Right? The same principles. It's a giant magnet with some radio stations in the bottom. We emit some radio waves, and we have them come back. And I'll tell you, when I found out what this was, I realized Hollywood didn't have anything on being cool or sci-fi. What we can do in real life is so much more amazing than what's in the movies. With a magnet and radio waves, we can determine the structures of DNA. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today. All right, so first thing, what makes up DNA or what's the other one here? RNA, right? What's the difference and why do we care? RNA, or DNA lacks a hydroxyl group. Perfect. Where is it missing that hydroxyl group? Who wants to take a guess? Oh, close, close. That would be the third carbon, right? So what's this thing right here? What's this called? This five-membered ring. It's a ribose, and OSE tells you it's a, it's a sugar. C1, C2. So you were close. C2 is missing deoxy, right? Missing the oxygen on there, right? So you get a proton going up and a proton going down. So DNA assembles. And the backbone of your double helix is this part right here. You have a phosphate connected to a sugar. And that comes down, connects to another phosphate. Where does the nucleic acid go? Where does the base sit? Right there. On the one prime carbon, right? OK. So DNA is going to assemble into a series of polymers. You will, right? And those polymers are going to get packed up into structural repeating segments, right? And they're going to carry the genetic information. So DNA is the blueprints. Well, then what's the RNA for? Does anyone remember the Human Genome Project? Right? Big thing in the 90s. What was the major punchline of the human genome? Does anyone know? Sequenced for the first time, human DNA. What did we find out? Found out that humans and earthworms have roughly the same number of genes. Genes are the regions of DNA that encode proteins, right? So a gene is a blueprint for a protein. Think about that. Are you more complicated than an earthworm? Hopefully. Hopefully. Maybe I don't want to go there, but right? The cellular complexity inside an earthworm, I'll tell you, it's a whole lot more simplified than a human being, right? What makes us special? We're compartmentalized. We have specialty types of cells, right? Well, how do we get that if there's only you know, a similar number of blueprints? So DNA, what happens to DNA? How does it get from DNA to RNA? Does something just come along and delete the hydroxyl? It's transcribed. transcribed, right? We have a process. So we have transcription from DNA to RNA, right? And then RNA eventually becomes a protein. And what process is that? Translation. So you have this intermediate, right? Now DNA. You can purchase it. You can buy a DNA solid phase synthesizer, and we can make some in the lab. It's actually pretty fun. You just program it in, out comes DNA. And you can work with it. You can have undergrads characterize it. It's pretty stable. You could drink it, no problem. Wouldn't recommend it. Don't do it on our campus, please. RNA is a different animal. RNA is different here. It becomes susceptible to cleavage falls apart really quick. Okay. So this is designed to be this fleeting intermediate. But what does it do? What is the study of RNA? Why do we have it? It was a field that was born out of the Human Genome Project. Does anyone know? Have you ever heard of epigenetics? Epigenetics, right? RNA 
can dictate and modify the production of proteins in amazing ways. We find out that RNA. And still today, there's major discoveries being published. Not too long ago, we find that there's these small coding RNAs that are really important for everything. I just worked on a project with folks in Holland where we found RNA actually controls an inflammation pathway in the heart that leads to edema and heart disease. Right? So RNA does amazing things that we don't truly understand yet. Right? So there's just a vast amount of information encoded in DNA structure, in DNA properties, and in RNA, and ultimately the production of proteins. So the general analogy I like to give with this is a protein is kind of like a construction equipment inside the city. If you think of your cell as a city, the proteins that are made, they're the factories, they're the trucks, they're the heavy equipment, right? Your DNA is the blueprints. The RNA is all the workers that's going to tell you when to make it, how to make it, what timing to put it in, you know, should we make more, should we modify the plans? So that's how all that fits together. My goal today is to get you guys excited and curious about this. I don't plan on you retaining any of this, but I plan on you getting excited and be like, wow, that was cool. Maybe I want to learn more about that, right? Sadly, I do not work with this stuff anymore. Like I said, ion channels these days and cardiac physiology. But. All right, so nucleotide, nucleoside, and phosphate. So we said, so what is this, DNA or an RNA? Why? Two prime and a two double prime. Very good. All right, so what would be different with the RNA? Which one would it be missing? The top one or the bottom one? Bottom one's usually missing, right? All right, so we have our phosphate here, surrounded by oxygen. What would be attached off this phosphate? Where would this go? It'd go to a hydrogen normally, but it would actually connect to another one of these down here at the C3 prime position, all right? So nucleotide. It's the name for a nucleoside plus the phosphate group. Right? So naming convention. Why are names important? Why do we have so many names in science? In science, our goal is to describe things. In order to describe things correctly, we have to have precision with our language. So something I feel like I'm repeating more and more frequently with folks, I think we're losing as a culture, is the ability to accurately describe things. In order to communicate what you're working on, you must understand the vocabulary first. If I were to teach you to be an auto mechanic, right? As a hobby, I work on old engines for cars. But if I were to teach you to work on cars, I can't teach you unless you know the tools, and you know the names of the tools and the names of the parts. And science is the same way. You have to know the vocab. So how do you learn the vocab? What's the best way to do that? What do you guys think? What are you doing right now? Take class. Take class. Great. Read some papers. Talk to your friends. Talk to other people. Science isn't something you can pick up and just do for 30 minutes a day. You'll find out if you have the disease of being a scientist, you become addicted to it, right? You live it. You read about it. You study it. You get excited about it, right? And if you don't learn your vocab, you get up and you communicate one thing really quick. You don't know what you're doing, right? So vocab's important. It allows us to accurately characterize and describe things. All right, so what are these right here? What do we have? Hearing whispers. You gotta, you gotta speak up. I can't hear y'all. <laughs> All right, we have purines, right, and pyrimidines. But what are these? Nucleic bases, right? The building blocks of life. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil. Is that DNA? RNA. Very good. Thiamine. And what goes to what? A pairs with T, usually. G pairs with C. What about this one? Adenine. What's the difference here between uracil and thiamine? 
the methyl group on the end. Very good. Some more names, right? Purines, well, let's back up. Purine, short name, big base. Pyrimidine, long name, small base. See that? Short name, two rings, big name, one ring. It's backwards. It's one trick that helped me remember that. All right, so purines, we have adenine, guanine, nucleoside, nucleotide, nucleic acid. Okay? Handy to get these things. If you work with nucleic acids, cut this out, tape it on your desk wall, tape it to the side, put it on the inside of a notebook, keep a cheat sheet, right? You'll never know when, it's, when it comes in handy. So the nucleic acids are polymers. We mentioned this, right? They connect. And they connect via this phosphate group here. All right, so you have a five prime end. Why five prime? Where do we come up with the five from? If we look at the carbons, we've numbered them. One, two, three, four, five. See that? So we're going to call this side the five prime end. And as we come off the three prime, we connect down to the other five prime. Down here off this carbon, off the sugar, we call this the three prime end. So DNA has directionality. All right? So when we write a sequence, we typically write it from five prime to three prime. All right? And it matters. So DNA, RNA typically is read, so normally you read from five prime to three prime. Okay, DNA versus RNA. DNA is less reactive. We kind of hinted at this. Does anyone remember why? Why does RNA degrade so easily? And someone, what was the difference we had? Remember, between DNA and RNA? Exactly. See, it's highlighted in red. This hydroxyl here, right? So how many of you guys are chemistry bound or focusing on chemistry? Quite a few. Okay, perfect. So what's unique about a hydroxyl compared to a hydrogen? What does it have more of? Why is it more reactive? Say, I think you said that. I can't. I, say it again. Louder. Oxygen has... Lone pairs of lone pairs of what? Electrons, right? And electrons, this can react with things, right? Chemistry can happen, right? All right. Protons, not so much. RNA is easily attacked by enzymes. DNA, not so much, right? I can give a 10 mer, so 10 nucleic acids or 10 base pairs of DNA, make a duplex, I can give that to an undergrad, and I would estimate it'll last usually three to six months of them playing with it. You know, if it's one millimolar, I might expect most of it survives. I get back half at the end of six months. I can almost guarantee if I give an RNA duplex to anyone other than someone who's worked with it for 10 years, it's gone in a couple days. It just falls apart and degrades. You have to be very, very aware and methodical of how you handle this stuff. It's all done in controlled environments. All right, so here we have two structures, DNA and RNA. Which one is which? Let's see how good you guys are. You got two choices. Is the DNA in blue or is the, RNA, or is the DNA in red? And how would you know? We'll take a guess, what do we think? How many vote for DNA in blue? Raise your hand. How many vote for DNA in red? Raise your hand. Oh, okay. How many of you are just confused and don't want to vote? Well, we're close to a majority. You're correct, DNA in blue here, right? What do you notice that's different about the DNA helix? Yep, you've got it with your hands. Say it out loud. It's the way it's turning. You're right. The bases are planar, right? And they stack. You can see this, right? The spacing between them. You can see nice, even gaps. This results in a nice helix that twists around. When we come over here to our RNA, 
What do you notice? It's a property called the tilt that changes between the planes and the base pairs. All right? You think this is important? Make any difference. Why would nature do this? Why would nature spend energy making this different? Think about that. I'm not going to tell you the answer right now. Think about that. All right. Who's heard of Watson Crick? Right. Hopefully everyone, right? Watson Crick. Standard. If you've, you've heard of A to T, G to C, you've heard Watson Crick. So I was a high school chemistry teacher many years ago. We taught this in eighth grade, or we at least exposed students to it so they could sound good at trivia. Watson Crick, two scientists, right? They characterized the structure, reported the structure of a DNA double helix. Revolutionary at the time, right? They didn't know prior to Watson Crick, we didn't know if the nucleic acid content was on the inside of the helix or on the outside, right? This was a seminal contribution to science. Help to start to understand how things work. So base pairing, all right. So we have our A to T base pairing, and how many dashed red lines do we see? Two. So really interesting. If I take this T and I put it in solution in water, this proton on this nitrogen is labile. What does that mean, labile? Can exchange. Protons on water can exchange with this over time, can go away. But if I partner it in a base pair, it binds to the T and it traps it. And all of a sudden, that proton stays around longer. And why I get excited about this is with the, with the magnets and radio waves, I can put magnetization now into this proton. And it hangs around long enough where I can have it relax. And as electrons relax through a magnetic field, I can pick up a signal. And I have a way to measure if this base pairs. I can tell you if this is bound to the oxygen. Right? We can look at different spectra and start to characterize how these things come together. G to C. You'll see that how many red dashes are there? Three, right? So if you had to guess. Which is more stable, AT or GC? Question? I'll tell you after the class. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about Think about what it's used for. What does your body need it for? Right? So we have GC more stable. We have AT a little bit less. So if we're thinking of stability of a complex, if you have more GCs, do you think this melts or comes apart easier or harder? More or less energy? More energy, right? Does anyone know what we call, there's a physical property we use to describe how much energy is required to take apart DNA strands? Anyone want to take a guess? What's it? You guys are becoming scientists. Some of you already are. So how would you measure, let's do a thought experiment. How would you measure how much energy it takes to take apart two DNA strands? What's the type of experiment we could do? Melting. Okay, so what, what's involved? What do we have to do with DNA melting? Say, say that again, sorry. So what's in... But how are we going to do it? What are you physically going to do? If someone says, OK, I'm going to try a DNA melting experiment, what, what's involved? You're going to break the bonds. But how? Heat. OK. So you could put these inside some type of sample holder, or a cuvette, perhaps, right? And we could heat them. And what's going to happen as we apply energy? You're going to start breaking some bonds, right? And we need something to monitor. What do we monitor? What property could we monitor? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. UV vis changes. And in fact, single stranded DNA has a higher, a higher absorbance 
than duplex DNA. Does anyone know why? It has to do with base pair stacking, right? But okay, so we've got something we can monitor, something we can control so we can learn something. So you can take DNA duplexes, exactly as you guys said, you can put them in a cuvette. And you can apply heat, and you can learn how sequence alters the stability. Why would anyone care about that? Think about that. Why would we spend so much time and money wanting to understand DNA? All right, let's come back to structure a bit. Bases are planar. Nucleic acids, as I mentioned, they have this amazing amount of structure. Proteins are fairly simplified compared to nucleic acid structure. And here's the reason why. In a protein backbone, how many torsion angles do you have? Hint. Come on. And what are they? Phi and psi. In nucleic acids, you get five. Think about that. Your Legos snap together with two hinges. You can make a lot of things. But if you've got five, holy cow. Right? So DNA is not just this simple linear strand. It's this amazingly complex structure. You can do all kinds of things with it. All right? Most people just picture the classic double helix. But we can do lots of things. DNA can form all different things, many of which have physiological relevance. So in addition to five torsion angles, this sugar ring, we've kind of misled you a little. It's not really a ring like a penny actually sits like this, like this. There's a pucker. Did you guys ever play with those little toys? It's a little rubber half a circle. You can push the one side in and let it go and it pops back out, right? It's got a pucker to it. Nucleic acid is very much, the sugaring is like that. It can have two prime endo or it can have three prime endo, one side up or one side down, okay? The change in the DNA sugar pucker influences the angle of the backbone. So this is just another property we can characterize, DNA sugar pucker. And that tells us, and it should correlate to the backbone angles in the DNA. So you can do all kinds of experiments with NMR. You can measure things called coupling constants, and you can actually calculate the percentage of how much of your DNA is in a two prime, or we call that a north or a south position, three prime endo. And you can get the relative populations. This gives you insights into the DNA structure. Again, why would we care about the structure? Well, what if I wanted to make a therapeutic that bound a specific sequence? Hmm. Maybe I want to find a narrow minor groove. Right? Maybe I want to find a fat major groove. Well, now we can start to look at things. And people have discovered that AT-rich sequences give you narrow minor grooves. You can make specific drugs to bind in narrow minor grooves. You can exploit some of these properties to achieve specificity, right? The whole idea is getting your molecule where you want to go without messing with other things. So in order to do that, you have to understand the system around it. All right, so just like proteins, right? Proteins are made up of amino acids that we talked about. You can have a sequence. This little D stands for the DNA or deoxyribose, right? Then the base, so DA, DG, DT, Right? Or we can write it all in caps. A, G, T, C, right? Remember RNA. What's different with the RNA? The T becomes a U. All right. As I mentioned, there's many different structures. So you can see here, if we make two-dimensional representations, you can make knots, you can make cruciforms, you can make holiday junctions, hairpins, bulges, right? So I think... During my PhD, I characterized eight different nucleic acid structures. Understanding RNA structure was important for understanding where retroviral integrase, things like HIV, how they assemble and attack, and where they integrate into the human genome. Understanding DNA structures was, a, was important for understanding different cancer therapeutic treatments. Right? We can make DNA-RNA hybrids, and we can modify the backbone to try and develop something called an antisense treatment plan. This was something that was in fate you know, in vogue, if you will, in the late 90s, it's now coming back, right, and becoming one of the hottest treatments out there. So understanding these structures can be really important. So we have A-form DNA, we have B-form DNA, and then my PhD advisor actually characterized this here, as he would say, Z-form DNA. 
He published this in science back in the late 80s, up in Calgary. So Z if you're from Switzerland, Z if you're from American. Right? And so this is really wonky and really different. So DNA can do many, many things. All right, so you have all these torsion angles. There's a book from Blackburn. You don't have to memorize these, but know what they are. These provide descriptions of all the different structural properties, right? Again, giving us ability to have precision in our descriptions, having the ability to communicate information. Not just here's a picture, but what are the properties that we need to know about and why are they important, right? Is 146 different than 166, right? That depends. What's the question? What's the level of precision we have? Well, it gets crazy. We often think two-dimensional, but DNA can do crazy things. This starts to look like a bowl of pasta with my son playing with it, right? It tangles all up. There's things called tertiary and quaternary structure. So primary structure is driven by sequence. Secondary structure, we have things like helices. We can organize and tie knots and loops, make tertiary structure. We can assemble different molecules into macromolecular quaternary structures. And we can start to build miniature molecular machines. And that's where it gets really exciting with what happens in physiology or inside your body. So, wanted to give you guys a little bit of appreciation for why all of this matters. Your body encounters DNA damage on a phenomenal rate. When I say phenomenal, I mean you have 100,000 lesions, 100,000 things happen to the DNA in your body per cell, per cell, per day, or per hour in UV light. That's a whole lot of damage. And these are the blueprints that keep you alive. Healthy human heart, healthy human cells, sorry, forgive me, too much in the heart world. Healthy human cells. <laughs> 10,000 lesions per day, right? Stay out of the sunlight. You still have a problem. Now, your body is amazing. It has evolved and it's developed these repair pathways to fix all of this. But what happens if it doesn't? You accumulate errors, copy over errors. DNA damage is the major driving force behind cancer. And I bet you probably at least 50% of the people in this room personally know or have experienced some form of cancer or know someone who has in their life, right? Understanding these structures, understanding how these things work allows us to understand the disease and to develop ideas on what to do about it, right? This is where the science is at. It's not some glowing green test tube that you mix together and push a magic button. It's knowing how it's made, knowing how it works. Maybe it does become a glowing green test tube someday, I don't know. All right, so I mentioned magnets and radio waves. This is actually an NMR sample. This is a one millimolar DNA RNA hybrid sample. We took a strand of DNA and we put some RNA together. All right, and I put it inside these magnets and I pulsed it with radio waves. Holy cow, we get back some, some interesting signals, some radio frequencies. And those frequencies depend on the structures. And so each one of these protons has been color coded based on its local environment. And it gives you back a frequency. That radio frequency observed occurs in this region on our spectra. And we can learn about the different protons and where they are, right? So we have a way to mark and characterize the local environment. So we can actually take our DNA and we can play more sophisticated games. We can apply radio pulses of magnetization, and we can excite five electrons out of 10,000 up into a higher orbit. And we can actually, using a series of pulses and delays, move that magnetization through bonds, and even through space, into other parts in a controlled manner. And so I can literally input magnetization here and move it over to there. I can start on my base, and I can walk down to the proton on the sugar. And I can check the distance through space. I can go again and move it through a nuclear overhauser pulse sequence, I can move it to the next nucleotide. And I can get back and I can not only plot these things in one dimensional spectra, but I can do them in two dimensional, three dimensional, four dimensional. You can sort them out up to five. Now I think nine dimensional NMR spectras are possible. And eventually we play crazy games of connected dots. 
It's the ultimate Rubik's cube. You sit here and literally track with this sequence, and I'm like, well, if this base is here and I know this environment, this is a, a simple two-dimensional NMR nosy homonuclear proton-proton spectra from a DNA RNA hybrid. You can see we can walk these pathways and you can learn, look, this peak's intense, that one's not so much, this one a little bit, here it goes, right? I'm learning and studying and characterizing what's going on. And man, it's fun, it's wild. Okay, so we can look at this. We can also study other things besides treatments. Does G normally go to T? Does it pair? It's unusual, right? We call this a mismatched piece of DNA. And in this study, I was looking at how does the sequence surrounding either side affect it, right? So you can have a GT mismatch, but if you put it surrounded by an AT, well, we get a gap in our sequence when we play connect the dots there. If I put my GT and I put an A here and a C there, well, now it's different. Look, it's shifted where the weak point is. This makes a difference. And what we're doing is looking to find a signature. How does a DNA repair enzyme find where to fix the problem? Because maybe we want to help it. Right? Maybe we want to make it so you can fix all these DNA mismatches. Or maybe we want to break it. So when you have cancer and we give you a chemotherapeutic, your repair pathway doesn't hang on to the bad cells. And we can kill them with less toxin and save your other cells or organs in your body. So understanding this stuff is important. So we can characterize macroscopic properties. We can do things with residual dipolar coupling. And we can look at how damaged lesions actually bend over DNA helices and unstack the base pairs. And if you follow the molecular wire theory from Jackie Barton, it might be that this unhinging unstacks DNA and allows the repair mechanism to find the one out of 8 billion base pairs that's broken and ultimately signal for repair. All right. So let's have a short discussion, because we're running a little bit behind. But what do you guys think? I'm giving you a few examples. Technologies that have arrived from DNA, RNA, structural biology. Who wants to take a guess? We talked about one of them a little bit. Right? Something called an antisense approach. Have you guys ever heard that before? So the whole concept of antisense was if I put DNA strand plus RNA strand, the body doesn't like it, right? So there's an enzyme in your body called RNASH, and it comes along and it degrades the RNA. Okay? Well, what happens? Well, that DNA is free to go off and bind something else. And if we make a specific sequence, nine base pairs is enough to confer unique binding anywhere in the body, to any part of your genome, just nine base pairs. It's amazing. We could achieve selective targeting of certain regions, couldn't we? And have those degraded and take out RNA signal. And this was a huge rage in the late 90s, right, when we were working on it. The problem was the RNA or the DNA got degraded before it should, trying to get it into the body. But they, since I was at a meeting in Switzerland, they're starting to work this out. And it turns out they can put different unique sequences on either side and protect it. They can modify the backbone, they can protect it and have it work. So probably more famous than this nowadays, DNA repair was utilized uniquely, intentionally, to make modifications and things. Has anyone heard of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing? I see some heads nodding. What does it do? Someone tell me. You can edit genes. Oh, cool. So what? Big picture. I, I, my, my care is that you guys have some semblance of a big picture. So what does CRISPR editing do? What does it give us ability to do? If I want to study a heart arrhythmia, and I know that's driven by a broken sodium channel, right? How am I going to do that? Can I take a person and just take their heart out and hang it up in the lab and start doing some experiments on it? No. Not a good idea, right? Can I take a mouse and do that? Maybe. It's expensive. In the old days, I had to use siRNA, silencing RNA, knock it down, change it, modify it. What does CRISPR allow us to do? Well, you could, you could go in and change, actually, a polymorphism. You're right. You could go in and possibly correct it. Right? One of the coolest examples I heard of is a man named Eric Olson. Are you guys familiar with muscular dystrophy? Right? There's a protein called dystrophin. And that pr the problem with muscular dystrophy is you have two copies of it. 
One of them is the only one you need. The other one, if it's made in a muscular dystrophy patient, if it's only made incorrectly, has a premature stop codon, you wind up with garbage protein littered all over the cell, right? And so Eric's group figured out a way to go in and move that stop codon so you only make the one good copy. And the last I'd heard when he was giving a talk over there in uh, Le Diablerie, they literally took a girl, pretty much had a very short terminal life, and they didn't just cure the disease, they removed it. Now, she has to live with an adenovirus in her body. But with CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, they were able to literally take out the other gene. Absolutely amazing, mind-blowing. Like I said, Hollywood doesn't have anything on that. All right, we gotta speed it up a little. All right, so we're gonna review some biology, right? So molecular biology. So we're gonna switch gears a bit. Molecular biology, big picture. Why do we, what do we use molecular biology for? So let's come back to, I want to study human heartbeat, right? I want to study the sodium channel. Where do I get my protein? In the old days, I could go down to the slaughterhouse and I could get a cow brain and I could purify my protein from there, all right? I work on a protein called calmodulin. It's a calcium binding protein. At best, there's 30 micromolar in the brain. That's not bad, but it's awful tedious. But what do you do about an ion channel that's around in 20, 30 nanomolar concentrations, kind of up the creek. Molecular biology gives us the power to manipulate the genetic information inside a bacterial cell, right? And we can use this to make recombinantly expressed proteins. We can overexpress them, right? So eukaryotic animal cells has a nucleus where your DNA is stored. There's membrane-bound organelles inside them, so these are the various components. We'll go a little quicker through this. Intro to bio, you have prokaryotic types of cells. Remember, there's no nucleus. DNA is not linear, but circular, right? No ends. So you have these circular loops. No organelles, but ribosomes. What's a ribosome do? Transcription or translation? Translation, which is what? RNA to protein, RNA to protein. excellent. All right, and it's crowded. So the central dogma, DNA goes to, what's that M mean? Messenger RNA, right? We said RNA does many different things. Epigenetics, it regulates a lot of stuff. But some of the RNA encodes for protein. Synthesized RNA from thermis, RNAs form five prime to three prime, right? Now we have, as we said a moment ago, messenger RNA is translated into protein. Proteins are extruded from the ribosome. So believe it or not, a new emerging research interest that everyone thought was already established. How does the protein get from the ribosome to the membrane? In the ion channel world, we all assume the classic dogma that they go to the Golgi and the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then they're chaperoned to the membrane. And it turns out that's not even remotely true. There's all kinds of different things that go on. So the Wild West and the frontiers are still out there. It's not all solved, right? So understanding how protein's made, there's a lot of big money going into that again. So here you have your genetic code. Remember that there's many ways to make an amino acid, right? Why are there many ways? Why don't we just have three codes? Or three letters for one, one for each? It allows for a little bit of directed evolution, yeah. Right? It allows for complexity in the system. It allows for organizing the information in a simplified way and doing many things with it. Reading frames. So a reading frame, how many nucleic acids do I need to encode a protein or a messenger RNA piece? How many, how many make up, how many uh, nucleotides do I need to encode for an amino acid? Three, right? One, two, three, so ACT, right? So then we can make tyrosine, leucine, leucine. Reading frames are, which three are we reading? You could start with ACT, CTT, TTA, right? Depends where it gets fed into the machine or the molecular machine. All right, so let's think briefly about our experiments here. What's an aqueous buffer? What's aqueous? Water. 
Take a little bit of buffer. Give, give me your favorite buffer. Heaps. So 10 millimolar heaps, right? What's a buffer do? It's a proton sink and a proton emitter. It maintains proton concentration, which we call pH. Great. Is this a good model inside a cell? So I get yelled at this all the time, especially when I'm at the hospital, right? Because we study things in test tubes that aren't even close to the inside of a cell, right? It's the best we, we can do. So is 10 millimolar heaps similar to the inside of a cell? Let's ask it this way. How many of you would like me to replace the inside of your cells with 10 millimolar heaps? <laughs> Hopefully no one. OK. What else is in the, in the buffer? What's in your cytoplasm? Salts. Yes, thank you. How much salts? Roughly. Well, you don't have one molar inside your cells, or you have a problem. 30 millimolar molar would be a problem, too. So typically, you have around 140 millimolar extracellular sodium, 10 millimolar intracellular sodium. Right? You have 2 millimolar extracellular calcium. You have anywhere from 100 nanomolar to 1 micromolar intracellular calcium. Right? There's concentration gradients between the insides and outsides of the cell. Right? I care about those because I study ion channels, and those concentrations drive gradient changes. Those changes change electrical currents, ultimately, which make your muscles move, your brain think, and your heart beat. Okay. Aqueous buffer, there's limitations to our experiments. right? As long as you understand that, then you can appropriately interpret the data. But you've got to think about what you're measuring, what your system is that we're describing. DNA, what's the charge on DNA in the backbone? Does anyone know? It's negative, right? There's a lot of sorry, I didn't mean to. There's a lot of oxygens on the backbone. That gives it a negative charge, right? Likes to bind salt. If we study all of our DNA with no salt, we may not get things that are as physiologically relevant. If you remove salt, you can take B form DNA helices and drive them towards A form and get incorrect answers, or maybe not the answer you expected. Or non-physiological answers. So how do we make a protein? We choose an expressive system, right? E. coli is the most common and the easiest. Okay. Is there a protein expression system available? Yes, great. Can you get it from the cow brain? OK, great. Purify it. Do the experiments. Wonderful. Right? Always figure out what your goal is before embarking on this. Making a new protein is not always trivial. It can take years, if it's possible. Right? For a decade, they worked on calmodulin-dependent kinase, CAMK2. And from E. coli, the best they got back was 10 nanograms ever. And then someone decided to put it inside an insect cell expression, and now you can get back micrograms, right? So you can do all different types of experiments. But you choose a system, you need your sequence, you're going to express it in bacteria, you're going to find out if it overexpressed. Maybe you're making a DNA replication protein. It may mess up the inside of the cell and kill the system itself. A lot of trial and error in this, right? As you do go down your scientific career, Pay attention to what systems are available to characterize. You can spend two to three years developing a system. Do you get any scientific credit from determining systems? What is your goal as a scientist? What are you most interested in? Discovery, right? How do you communicate your discoveries to the world? Who said that? Say it louder. Starts with a P. Publications. We don't publish developing systems. We publish results. Be aware of that. Right? But without this, there's nothing to study. So it's a balancing act. All right, chromosome is circular. Replication starts at an origin of replication. Uh, circular DNA can be replicated if it has an REI or reading frame. We're going to have to cut this a little bit short. Lactose on, or lac operator, right? So. Bacteria want to produce proteins if they are needed, right? How do we control the bacteria to make it do what we want? Why metabolize lactose when glucose is easily available, right? Set of genes under the control of genes in the cell. So all of this has to do with how do we make the bacteria make the protein that we want, right? So recombinant DNA expression, right? Know what it is. Know why you use it. Know what you use it for, OK? So lac operators, they prevent RNA 
polymerase at the promoter region. LAC-Z converts LAC into gale or glycose by hydrolyzing glycosidic linkage, right? LAC-Y pumps LAC into the cell. So once you have your plasmid of interest in bacteria, and I'm running a little over, what do we need next? Oh, do we go into IPPG? No, forgive me. All right, so here's your plasmid. And set up, we have, what parts do you need in, in your plasmid? You need your gene to encode the DNA, right? And we need some instructions to make the bacteria do what we want it to do, to overexpress. If it only made a small amount of your protein, it wouldn't be of any interest, right? We want to overexpress as much as we can. So IPTG, this turns on protein expression. So the steps for when we're making a bacteria, right? You do your molecular biology, you set up your gene, you set up your template in your plasmid, you then transform into your bacterial cell, right, if we're using bacteria. We then amplify the number of cells, right? Looks and smells like funky chicken soup, okay? It's E. coli, we've modified it so it won't make you as sick, but don't drink it. At IPTG, all of a sudden, your cells machinery is turned on, it starts making protein, all right? Protein expression can be switched on with this, right? When should you induce? Want to wait till your cells heat something called, you're in lag phase, here you're in log phase, and then it lags again. Where's the healthiest part on this curve for the cells, for counting them? Log phase, right here, right? Where they're multiplying the fastest. Add your IPTG when you hit about 0.6, you're going to make the best, most protein usually. All right. Best at log phase, as we said. Lag phase may cripple the cells typically between 0.5 and 0.6. But most importantly, do not recreate the wheel. If someone's already worked it out, read it. If it's been published and you don't understand it, email them, call them. Be efficient with your time, because ultimately characterizing the protein is what's going to get you points on the board. All right, ampicillin resistance. I think we're going to have to go a little bit. How many more do I have? Just one more. So we use antibiotics to stop infections, right? We don't want the bacteria to pick up unwanted things, right? And so summary real quick, DNA structure, nucleic acids and reactions. We can use recombinant protein to make our proteins of interest. Molecular biology allows us to make things so we can study them in better detail. All right. Thank you. Sorry, I ran a few minutes over. Let's take a 10-minute break.